morning, everybody. Good morning. It's good to be back in God's house. Amen. That's right. To be blessed to be able to be in God's house. Before we turn in our scripture, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, as we come to you this morning, Lord, we bow our heads in humility and in love for you. And Father, we pray that as we begin to put our hearts and our minds together in what you would have us to hear today, Lord, that you would ever lead, guide, and direct in the way you would have us to voice what you've given us to share with the people today. And oh God, you know that we live in a day and time when it's so important for us to be so grounded in your word. Most of all, Lord, to trust your wisdom and your leadership and your guidance. Now you pray, I pray you be with us in the next few minutes. And ever help us to hide ourselves behind the cross and help us all to close our minds to the outside world, to things going on around us, and focus just on what you'd have us to hear. For it's in Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen. Folks, we're living in a time where it's true that prophecy is being fulfilled. As all that's taking place with Israel right now and over in the other countries and someone and I were talking on the phone throughout the last couple of weeks and another person said well you know it really makes me nervous and I said don't make me nervous and the individual said well why not and I said because if you study the word it's just the fulfilling of the prophecy the Lord's coming back we are standing on the verge of eternity. Any way we look at it. Now when I say that, I also say that with helping us to understand that with God, a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. What we consider a long time is just a day to him, but to him it may be. But I truly believe that we are on the verge of eternity. And when, the Bible also talks about it, and I'm going to get into that a little bit this morning, but if you have your Bibles while I'm talking, if you will, turn to Isaiah chapter 55, and my main verse is one verse, and that's verse 11. Because we live in a day and time where you can tell in churches throughout the country that there's such a falling away, that people have so much that they want to going about being busy doing and what have you, that God is not important like he used to be. And that's a sad thing. But there's one thing I need us to understand. In each of our individual lives, in this church, and in everything we do, the title of this morning's sermon is The Power of the Seed, quote, God's Word, unquote. The Power of the Seed, God's Word. And I want you to look with me in Isaiah 55 and 11 today, and we're going to explore and talk about the power and the potential of the seed. When we look at Mark 4, it talks about the seed, and we know by the interpretation of the parables that the seed is the word. And you know, many times we talk about God being active in our lives. We talk about God answering our prayers and doing things for us, and we believe that. And we think that God works out of the heavens from his throne. We think he does everything sovereignly. But I tend to disagree with you. No, God works in our hearts, folks, and through the things that we sow in our hearts. He works through the seeds that we put in our hearts. The seed is the word of God. And God works in our lives through his word. And the greatest way that the Holy Spirit leads us through his word, the Holy Spirit says he, he says that he will never say anything to us inconsistent to what the word says. Let's read Isaiah 55 and 11. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper us in the things whereto I send it. In other words, he's not going to say anything in the Bible 
and then say something entirely different for us in our hearts. I've heard people say, well, the Bible says this, but, folks, there is no but. The Bible tells us that we are to try the spirits, and we're to see if they're of God. How do we try the spirits? We try the spirits by the word, by God's word, his word and his kingdom, and through the vehicle of his word. We're going to find out that the enemy attacks the word. Did you know that? The reason the enemy attacks the word is because the word or the seed is full of power. How is the power of God released? It's released through his word. Even in creation, the Bible said God used the word as his vehicle of his creation. He used his word as a vehicle. To bring the things in our lives that we need. If you don't put the word in there, you don't give him much to work with. Have you ever thought about that? You know, have you ever noticed that in churches where they don't teach healing, you never hear about healing? It's the churches when they talk about God's healing power that people are healed. If you don't have the word on the subject, then things don't happen. Churches where no one is ever saved is because they never talk about salvation or the gospel of salvation. Isaiah 55 and 11. This is the Lord's talking. Let me say it again. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth and not return unto me void. Folks, the, for, the word void means empty or ineffective. Now, let's use the word empty and unproductive. And he also says that it will not return to me empty or unproductive. The King James says it will not return unto me void, which means it's not going to come back to me empty. It's not going to come back. So when you are doing what God's called you to do, you have the power of the seed, his word. What does a seed do when you plant it? It produces, and so does his word. A good example is found in John 1 and 1 when he said, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then verse 14 goes on to say, The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. See, the Word of God came into the earth in flesh form. <coughs> and his name was Jesus. God sent that word who became flesh into the earth. Was it productive? Did Jesus accomplish anything when he was on earth? Absolutely. What did he accomplish? He purchased our salvation. He paid for our redemption. He suffered the penalty of death and hell and paid the price for physical healing and peace of mind and prosperity. He paved the way for us. It was not void of power, and it was not empty, and it was not unproductive. It was very productive. And God said, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me. King James says void. Other editions say empty, unproductive. But it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the time wherein I sin. See, God did not give his word to us to be inactive in our lives. He gave his word to us so that it could be produced in us. <coughs> what does it produce? Well, if you're doing what you're supposed to be, <clears throat> and you're following through on God's word in your life, it's going to produce other, it's going to produce the kingdom for him. You know, the Bible, and there's some religion, not the Bible, but there are some religions that say, well, you just need to leave everything up to God. That's not how God works, folks. God has put it in our hands. <clears throat> he works within your life and within my life through his word. And when that seed, his word, is in our life, things are going forth like they are supposed to go. In fact, you know, he breaks the power of sin. 
The word, it gives us what we need so that we are no longer slaves in sin. We are righteous in God's eyes when he saves us. God's word or that seed does a work in our lives. And the Bible says we are born again by the incorruptible seed of the word of God. God's word is not corruptible. It's sent forth to produce. It's not empty. It's not void of power. You know, I'm afraid in this day and time we live, religion has taken all the power or trying to take all the power out of the word of God. Now, you notice I said religion, not Christians. Mm. Religion has taken the power. That's why today anything goes. There's a lot of people out there under the assumption of religion that is accepting this, that's totally against God's word, this seed. And they're doing it just to please. I'm going to tell you something. If I have to compromise God's word and what his seed teaches me, the power of this word, if I have to compromise that to have a church full of people, I don't want it. Amen. Because it's false doctrine. It's false teaching. And it's sending people's soul straight to hell. That's right. When I just compromise so that I can say, this person is like this and that's okay, that's wrong, folks. That is not being what the power of the seed wants us to be. That's not what God wants us to do. <coughs> there is nothing in this world that is worth us giving up that power, the power of the seed, God's word, to compromise so that we can just be popular. I had rather be by myself the rest of my life in everything I do than to compromise God's word just to have popularity. It doesn't matter to me because God wants me to have the power of that seed in my life. And when we have the power of the seed, Romans 1 and 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. When we say that this is not God's word, you're denying the power of the kingdom. When we say that things that are going on in this day and time, and it's okay, you may not agree with it, but if you just say, it's okay, I'm not going to say anything, that's the same as denying God's power. We can't do that. We have to not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. We have to believe and we have to push forward this power of the seed. Because when a seed is planted, what happens? You plant an apple seed, an apple tree grows, and then what happens? You have apples, and what's in the apples? More seeds and more seeds, because when we have the power of the seed, we are growing God's kingdom. And I will tell you right now, when we have the word of God, it's the very life and the power of God. If we partner with God and do what he has given us permission to do in our lives, he'll produce everything, everything that is in this book on the inside of me. On the inside of you. I don't have to worry about not doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm not looking at numbers. I'm not looking at figures. Is it great to have great big numbers of people? Sure it is. But what I'm looking to do is have the power of the seed of God's word to work in my life. Because he says it won't go out void. Now I may not see it directly. You may not see it directly, but he says it won't go out void. When you talk to somebody about the Lord, and when you're praying for somebody, and you're asking God to help them, he says it doesn't go out void. <coughs> when you're showing somebody else God, whether it's through the life you're living or what you're trying to show them in his word, he says it won't go out void. You need not be discouraged. We need to take pride and we need to be happy in what we're doing for him on a daily basis. Because when we're serving him every day and the power of his seed, God's word, is in our lives, it won't go out void. 1 Peter 1.23, it says, Being born again, not of the corruptible seed, but of the incorruptible by the word of God, which lives and bides forever. Look at this again. 
There it is. It says not corruptible. It's incorruptible. So if we are living by the power of the seed, by God's word, our lives can live uncorruptible. I don't have to, you know, and this is just a personal thing with me now. I'm not throwing stones at anybody. But when people, I hear people walking around and they say, I'm just having the hardest time. The devil's just all over my back. I want to say, well, take the straps off. If you're God's child, you don't have any business with the devil strapped on your back. Because the Bible tells me that even the appearance of God will make him flee. How many times have you felt like that? Have you ever said, Satan, get out of here. I belong to God. That's all you have to do. Get that saddle off your back. You don't have to wear the devil's saddle. Will he still tempt you? Sure he will. Will he still try to tempt, put things in front of you? Sure you will. It's his job to try to discourage and destroy Christians if he can. But you don't have to let the devil strap his saddle on your back and ride you and cause you not to be because my Bible tells me that I have the power of the seed of God's word to live in my life. And when the devil comes to me and says, well, I just want you to know from what I see, you ain't doing much. You know what I say? Get behind me, Satan. The power of God's word will be fulfilled in my life, however he sees fit. The word of God, folks, is a living thing. You know, some people say they read the Bible, but they don't understand it. Well, one of the things we have to really do is focus on asking God to show us the power of his seed in our lives. And when we do that, God will help us to understand as he wants us to understand. There are things I have been serving, I am 65 years old. I surrendered my life to the Lord when I was seven. But I have been in ministry one form or the other since I was 19 years old. And I thought as I was getting up in my 20s and 30s, I knew a lot. At 65, I realized there's so much more I need to learn. Just as we talked about in Sunday school this morning, if you lived to be 500 years old, you would not ever learn it all. And God gives us the power of his seed as he knows we're ready for it in our lives to help us grow. But the important thing is, is for us to focus on that seed. God's power is the vehicle that he uses and when it's released, it is awesome. The word of the word seed in the Greek, do you know what it means? I told you that I had been looking at some Greek. The Greek word for seed is sperma, S-P-E-R-M-A. Now, that'll give you a lot of insight on the nature of a seed. It's sperma. What happens? It's the thing that brings conception and life to the situation. Because when the sperm and the egg meet, something happens. Conception takes place. And that's where there's life. The seed is the image of the harvest. The acorn has within it an oak tree. The seed has the, has the equivalent of a whole oak tree. The little bitty acorn has all it needs to make an oak tree. And when it falls on the fertile ground, all things become equal. It will produce a mighty oak. And that's a natural illustration. Can you imagine what the seed of the word of God will produce on the inside of us? There is no limit to what we can be. If you dare to sow the word on the good ground of your heart, it will produce the image. It will produce in you everything that you will need to be or do or to accomplish your task. In life for God. For a minute, let's look back at the life of Jesus. In Luke 4 and 18, Jesus was quoting an Old Testament scripture. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel. And Paul said in Romans 1 and 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. And we notice here that Jesus says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. <coughs> Did you know that before the Holy Spirit anointed Jesus at his baptism, 
Have you ever studied back where he didn't do miracles before then? Go back and study it. This is some depth research I've been doing. And you say, well, I thought he was God. Yes, he is God. The Bible says that he emptied himself and became man. He was still God in flesh. He was all man and he was all God. He did not draw on the power he had as God when he was man. He emptied himself of that. The Bible says, and you can read it, the Bible says that Jesus grew in wisdom and stature. As God, did Jesus need to grow in wisdom back? The Bible says that Jesus grew in wisdom and stature. <clears throat> as man, he did not grow until he got older as he studied and grew in wisdom. Why? Because he emptied himself when he come here as man. It says that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. What does that mean? He has enabled me. He had to be enabled by the Spirit to do the things that he did in this earth. He had to walk as man. If he was going to walk as man, there were certain things that he couldn't draw upon as God. Now you think about that. That's deep, but you think about that. He came and emptied himself as man. And one of the things that there is is the power of God. Another one is omnipotence, all-knowing. The Bible says he had to learn wisdom. He had to be anointed by the Spirit, just like anybody else. Why? Because he came here as man, and when he did, he emptied himself. It says he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recover the slide and the blind, to set liberty those who are oppressed. Do you know how he did that? He did that by the anointing of God. But that anointing of God was encapsulized in the gospel of God. In other words, it was because of the gospel. Folks, the anointing is on the word. This book, these words are anointed by God. <coughs> if I tell you that God's not good, that's not true, and that's not any good because that's not in his word. Because the Bible says God is good. And if I tell you that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life, that is true. That is anointed because it's in this word. <coughs> and it penetrates the heart. We need to expect when we preach, things happen. I expect when I stand up here and speak that things are going to happen. May I see it? Maybe not. It doesn't matter. As long as I am doing what God's called me to do, he says his word will not go out void. When you're out working for God and doing what God's called you to do, it doesn't matter if you see a big result. If you believe and you're living what he says here, he says your word will not, his word will not go out void. If you're doing what God told you to do, then you're fulfilling his word. You're being what he wants you to be. In Luke 4 and 31, Jesus had just cast out an evil spirit. And he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word was with authority. It said he was teaching the word of God. He wasn't teaching out of Reader's Digest, or he wasn't preaching on a last opinion of Paul. He was preaching the word of God. And it says it was with authority. In another place, it says he was not like the Pharisees because his words were with authority. You know, the Pharisees didn't have authority. Did you know that? They were preaching the oral traditions more than the word of God. You know, unfortunately, we have a lot of traditions, oral traditions today. We get caught up in this system of religion sometimes, and we get more into the external and less into the internal. What is the internal, Donna? 
It's this word. It's this seed. It's the power in this word. See, it's sometimes not how you deliver it. It's what you say. Jesus was different from the Pharisees because they weren't preaching the word. They were preaching the tradition. That's some of the things that's coming out in Sunday school right now. When you preach the power, when you preach the word, it has its power in it. It's the word that produced, was produced in his heart. He was doing the things that he saw his fathers do. He was just saying the things that his father said. Verse 36 said, So they were all amazed and spoke among themselves, saying, What a word this is. With authority and power, folks, Jesus commanded the unclean spirits as they came out. He didn't whisper and say, Y'all get out of there. Now, he probably could have because he was Jesus. But he commanded. Commanded means with authority. And when you and I are living our lives, we need to live our Christian lives with the authority, with power in it, so that it will relate the true life of Jesus. Jesus' life was power. His word is power. And you and I, if we are living his word, we need to be living it with the power and the conviction so that we can display what he wants us to be and so that our seed will go forward and it will come out void. 1 Corinthians 4 and 20 says, For the kingdom is God, for the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. What that means is that the kingdom of God is not just in the words, it's in the power of the word. <coughs> when you speak the words of God, they have power. When I tell Satan, get behind me, I'm doing it in the name of Jesus. That has power. Paul said in Romans 1, 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written. The Bible says they shall live by faith. He says that the gospel of, of God in the power of God leads us to salvation. And the word in salvation in Greek word is soteria, S-O-T-E-R-I-A. It doesn't just mean the forgiveness of sins. It means to be made whole in every aspect of your life. It means deliverance, soundness, and wholeness of mind. <clears throat> it's an all-inclusive word has the power of the seed, God's word. You know, sometimes we pray when we don't need to pray. Sometimes we pray before it's time to pray. If God works through his word, what good is it to pray when we don't have a promise to base our prayer on? Now think about that for a minute. You're, not, you're just telling God your need. But you know what God's really moved by? It's your faith. When I pray in faith, that's when I will see movement in that seed. Because when I pray in faith, I'm not just telling God my need. He's seeing. He's seeing. God is moved by our needs, not by our wants. You know, if God saw the need and met the need, that's what it's all about, the power of the sea. Romans 16 and 24, it says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Not to him who is able to establish you, according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, but according to the revelations of the mysteries which was kept secret from when the world began. Notice he said the gospel was able to establish you. What is the gospel, folks? It's God's word. It's the power in this sea. How are you going to be an established Christian? It's through the gospel. How do you grow? Let me say it this way. I hate to tell us, and I hate to tell the church world, but just going to church 
is not going to cause you to be established. It's not. I can go to church every day of the week somewhere. I can find somewhere to go to church every day of the week. But that's not going to establish me. I can sing a song all the time. I can sing Christian songs every day. But that's not going to establish me. It's not going to establish you. And this is where I'm afraid the religious world is dropping the ball in life. With all these things that it's okay. It's okay to do this. We don't want to hurt their feelings. Forget your feelings. They need to be given the power of God's word. We need to be showing them what the word says. But the only way you are truly going to be established and have the power of the seed, God's word, is when you study and you learn and you work in this book and you apply it to your life. That's how you become established. That's how you become unshakable. That's how I know that I am what I am and that I'm doing what God has called me to do, that I am who God wants me to be, and I'm living my every day of my life to the best of my ability because I'm trying to live it through the power of God's Word and what He's instructed me. And that means that I don't have room to be compromisable. I can't compromise to the world. I have to stand on his word. You have to stand. But when we do that, we have the power of the seed, God's word. Here's the interesting thing sometimes I think people lose sight of. If we are born again, the kingdom of God is in us. It's here. God's kingdom is in me. And that's where he's going to, that's where he's established in me. Because I am in him and he's in you. You don't get that just from religion. You don't, folks. You get the power of the seed. And you become what God wants you to be. And you become successful when you are born to kin and his kingdom is living in you through the power of the seed, God's word. In closing, I ask us this question this morning. Do we need or do we have the power in our lives? Do we? If we don't, we need to ask God for more insight and bury ourselves more in this book, in this word. We need to plant the seed of the word in our lives and in our hearts. Because when we do... Whatever we do in for him, because when we plan it in our lives, we're going to do what God wants us to do. We're going to listen to his voice. And when we do that, we're going to produce new life for the kingdom. It will produce more than you will ever imagine. Ephesians 3 and 20 says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundant above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works. In us, what is the power? It's the seed. It's God's work. God's word. Amen. Folks, we need to search our lives. We need to search our souls. And we need to make sure that we are truly digging in and living by the power of the seed. God's word. Amen.